Hello, I'm Matt. And I'm Keith, and in this one we're talking future projects, table saw fences, and quoting for work. But first, as is often the case when we get together, we had a good chat about power tools. We hope you enjoy the episode. I wouldn't go onto the Milwaukee platform at the moment because a plunge saw is a essential tool for me. Yep. And I wouldn't go on the Makita because they don't have a battery table saw. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the colour is a bit there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's DeWalt, Bosch, or I think Hikoki, actually, are my options. Hikoki still haven't got a track saw, though, have they? Oh, have they? Oh, I thought they did. No, I don't think so. Oh, Metabo have. That's what I'm thinking. Have they? I think so. It, it's very confused because in America... Hikoki and Metabo are the same thing. Metabo HPT, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a Metabo. Um, I'm looking now. I've just Googled Metabo plunge saw. Uh, Metabo KT18. Yeah. And they do a, a table saw, actually, so I could go on Metabo. I just, um, I think I told you I had their planar thickness the same as yours, and the instructions were appalling. And several people have told me that when they phone customer service to ask for help, they just direct them to my video. Oh, really? And then I had a problem with my table saw I got from them and contacted them. They didn't even bother replying. I contacted them again going, hey, I'm the guy that made a video about your tool that you're directing people to me. Then I just asked them a question and they didn't bother replying. So, like, nah, I'm not getting their stuff. When I was working with Hikoki years ago now, they basically had a schedule of when tool releases were coming out and they, they mm. basically implied that it would be out within a couple of years. They've not put one out and neither have Milwaukee and it just makes you wonder why like there must be a huge market for people wanting track saws as a carpenter I can't understand why you'd be on that platform it's such a essential tool now if you're a carpenter hanging five doors a day yeah. the best way to cut those doors is going to be with a plunge saw rather than a circular saw cutting worktops yeah anything really and Ryobi are releasing one now as well yeah I saw so I think they're the same company as well well, they're, yeah, they, they're all part of Tectonic Industries or whatever it's called, right. TTI. So, and, and there's a lot of rumours about TTI putting out the Ryobi track saw so that they can get feedback and then improve the Milwaukee track saw. Oh, I thought the Milwaukee one was just around the corner. Yeah, no, I'm very much picking my next tool brand on the one that has all the tools I want. I should imagine a lot of people do. I would probably go with DeWalt mm -hmm. if I was starting fresh. But yeah, trend, I don't know why. The, the tools are quite... They, they are cheap, and they feel cheap. They feel a bit better than maybe uh, Einhell or whatever, but they don't feel as nice as the other big brands. Are they kind of in the Erbauer kind of bracket, if you know what yes, I mean? Yes, that's it. Just below tradesman tools kind of thing. Yeah, you could get away with light trade use. Yeah. But, I don't know, for a few quid more, I just want the better ones, really. So it's a very small market, I think, that. The DeWalt track saw also runs on the rails in both directions, doesn't it? Or yeah, it looks it's got nice. some sort of party trick like that. I watched a review, I think it was um, a skill builder do one, and I forgot what the American one, Tools in Action or something, they did a big, like, 20-minute long videos comparing them all. The DeWalt always comes out last on the track saw, but then their table saw is the best. So that's, But that's the thing with every tool brand, isn't it? There's no tool brand that everything they make is the best. The Makita track saw is supposed to be very good. I really love it. But then um, a couple of days ago, I watched a video by uh, a channel called Tools and Stuff. Um, and it was the comparison of the new Makita 40 volt plunge saw versus the 2 times 18 volt battery one that I've got. Yeah. And it really outperformed the 18 volt times 2 one, which mm. it was twice as fast at cutting. Wow. The motor's so much more efficient. So, yeah, I, I kind of watched that video and thought, oh, now I want that one. But kind of still in limbo until I know whether Milwaukee are going to be releasing one or not because I still yeah. have that dream of just getting down to one battery. <laughs> I like the DeWalt Flex Volt, as in you plug it into a 54-volt tool, it works, but you can plug it into an 18-volt tool and it works. I think that's... Yeah. There's no point being on one battery platform and then there's two different batteries on that mm. Just because the tools are the same colour. And it's yeah. a bit like I've got, I've got the 12 volt and the 18 volt now, but I like them both. They both have their own uses, I feel. And I think you're on 18 volt and 12 volt as well, aren't you? 
Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, the Hikoki 36 volt and 18 volt worked in the same way as well. You could use the 36 volt batteries on ah, the 18 volt. That's clever. Tools. Yeah, so it's a very similar thing, I think, between flex volt and multi volt, whatever it's called. Mm. So I don't have the Makita's the same. I would imagine it would be. I kind of feel what me and you do is not that demanding, is it? If you're on the job site all day, you want really good battery life and lots of power. If the cut takes slightly longer, it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah, I, I would agree in most instances. The only thing for me that I would want that extra power is usually the plunge saw again, because if mm. I'm cutting through a two inch thick slab of beach, the Makita does sometimes struggle with that. That's why when I saw that 40 volt one, I thought, wow, that, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> So what have you been working on? This morning, I've been out in my new workshop slash garage, the Clark one. So the video of that should uh, come up. Then I built a floor for it. And then it's kind of, um, do you ever, ha ever have it when the circumstances force you to change your plans a bit? So I was very much committed to working in my living room. I never thought I'd be able to afford to build a workshop because I'd costed it and it's going to cost me like seven grand to build the one I wanted. Oh my God. Yeah. Because timber prices literally are double what they were wow. when I built the last workshop. All the things, you look at a, a three by two, they were like two pounds 15 or something and now they're closer to five quid. So that's yeah. more than double. Same with sheets of OSB. You're talking 40 pounds for a sheet of OSB when it was probably under 20 pounds then so it's i don't have seven grand to spend so i hope the prices will go down but obviously the world is even more turmoil than when i first costed this but hopefully i've got the money next year so this clark garage thing seemed a great option of having a space i quite like working in my living room and it's nice to use the hand tools but when you need to cut down a sheet of a um, plywood or um, mdf it's nice to be a go outside and do it yeah I put down the weedproof membrane onto some very gravelly soil and I was like, that'd be fine to stand on. Uh, I don't want to take my workbench out of the living room because I still want it in there. I'm going to build a garden table. So I thought a normal table is about 60 centimetres high. No, 70 centimetres high, sorry. My workbench is 90. I'm going to split the difference and go for an old fashioned like kitchen table of about 80 centimetres. So you can sit at it and you can actually work at it. I like that idea. So I'll make a garden table, have it in the garage, make it out of treated wood, have it in the garage, put a bit of ply on top so I don't damage it, and then when I'm done with it, it can go in the garden and be a garden table. Then I decided, oh, I can bite the bullet and actually build a floor for inside the workshop. So I've done that, and that video will be out this week. And then uh, Axminster reached out to me and wanted to send me their new path system for cutting holes so actually I need to build a proper bench so now I had all the timber for this table all the plans changed I don't need anymore so I've been building that table this morning because I've got the wood and having a garden table would be nice but I find that sometimes you have these big plans and then just the, everything else changes around you and <laughs> you don't need to do that thing anymore that you spent mm. £100 on material for so yeah it's going to be I'm going to be working in two different spaces I think I'm going to have a machine shop which is outside, and then a hand tool assembly bit, which would be inside. Nice. Uh, maybe a pop, well, in the winter anyway, in the summer, I might do everything out there. Are you investing in another vice then for the new table? Yeah, I might uh, have a tool company that would send me one. Uh, but yeah, no, I've had a few people message on my vice videos, like, oh, I must fit a vice to my bench. And I know Jimmy Duresta for the whole time he's in New York never had a vice on his workbench. Really? Page. Yeah, he'd screw bits down to it. But for me, the vice is one of my most used tools. I, I use the vice probably on every project almost. Me too, yeah. I, I made a, uh, a bench hook and I've never used a bench hook as a bench hook, as in to hook over the side of the bench. I always stick it in the vice. Yeah. Because um, it's more secure. I use the vice for so many things. So yeah, definitely advice, a vice. Uh, I've got too many vices. God, everyone does that joke. I shouldn't do that joke. <laughs> I didn't get it until you said it was a joke. And then it, <laughs> then it That's like most of my jokes. <laughs> I'm just very slow. Uh, so what have you been working on this week? So I've just finished a project that I've been meaning to do for a while. I obviously built a new desk 
in my office a couple of months back. And since then, I've had a pile of stuff in the corner of the room, the printer, loads of stationery and stuff that I needed somewhere to put. And uh, I started building this cabinet. I had a vision in my head of what how I wanted it to look to complement the desk. And I did a drawing. And then I went out and worked out how much plywood I had to build it. And I just didn't have enough because... All of the offcuts of birch ply that I had were in different thicknesses. So I had some 6 mil, some 15 mil, some 18 mil and some 25 mil. And I, I was kind of juggling it around thinking, well, the top panel could be 25 mil, but then I'd need the side panel. It's just a bit of a nightmare. Um, so in the end, it feels like a, a project unlike any other project I've ever done before, because there are a lot of different features that I feel could work as independent videos. So I'm thinking I'm kind of, rather than just doing one project video encompassing the whole build, I'm thinking of doing one project video focusing on the main part of the build, two separate ones focusing on some features of the build, so one of which is making the most out of offcuts of plywood, and the second one is, I'll be careful what I say because I don't want to give away the content of the video, but it's a, an unusual use of Festool Dominoes. So did you have enough plywood or did you have to remortgage the house and buy some? I didn't buy any and that's uh, kind of going to lend itself well into this video about, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, it's probably going to be something along the lines of being thrifty with plywood. I used a um, sheet good calculator thingy this week actually because I never normally do because I, I never worry about it that much because I'll always use the bits, anything left over but... I had to buy some OSB for doing the floor of the workshop. And I would have used 18 mil, but it was so expensive. I thought, can I get away with 12 mil? And actually, 12 mil has been absolutely fine. And I can always put a subfloor on in the future if I want to. But I, I worked it out, used one of these things and uh, to give me the most efficient cut pattern. And uh, it, yeah, I never normally do that, but it worked quite well. Cool. Was that an online tool? Yeah, it was. I can't remember what it was called. There's loads available. And I... I do you remember when I was building a, a garden room for a friend that um, we downloaded an app to do it as well? Just because, especially if if you're not a woodworker, you don't want any bits left over because you're just going to take them to the tip. Me and you would keep everything and you know it will get used. What have you got between centres then underneath the 12 mil ply? I presume you've got a frame underneath, have you? Yes, uh, a 4 by 2 treated frame uh, i've done 600 centers apart from the last one i've nudged over a bit so that the sheets fall in the middle of the center and then i've got noggins all along um but yeah i don't know maybe if i had big cast iron bits of machinery it'd be, be another need something else but i can always in the future put another 9 or 12 mil osb going the opposite way on top or put a, another floor on but yeah no it seems fine and the, my living room is a concrete floor with um, laminated floor on top. Yeah. It kills my feet. Mm. As I've been working this morning out there on this suspended floor, and it is such a joy to work on compared to the concrete. Is the plan still to reuse the floor for your new workshop? The floor is three metres by six metres, roughly. So, yeah, hopefully, if I had a couple of strong guys, I reckon we could just literally drag it six metres forward and it'd be on the new workshop pad. Uh, if not, obviously I can see where all the screws are. I'm not going to paint it or anything. So I've just got to take the OSB off and the frame would come apart in two bits. Yeah, maybe an hour job to take it apart and put it back together again. But yes, this would be for the new workshop. So it's cost me about 400 quid yeah. to put this floor down. So that's 400 quid off the next workshop build. Wow in a two weeks time I'm going to have a workbench in there and this garden table with some extra thing and obviously I'm never going to leave anything out there because it's not exactly secure mm. but I better leave wood out there and uh, at the moment I've got three sheets of um, MDF in my living room it'd be nice not to have them in my living room <laughs> yeah speaking of floors I have a new floor as well I think by the time this podcast goes out, my video about the new floor will be out as well. But it's um, it's basically the floor tiles I mentioned, um, yeah. the kind of PVC floor tiles. Had a bit of an issue mid-project when I realised that my doors wouldn't open above the height of the uh, floor tiles. Mm. 
So that was interesting. Well, that's why you have a track saw. <laughs> well, that's not too far from the truth, actually. <laughs> um, had a few challenges, but it's down and it is amazing. Because I've been doing that new printer cabinet this week, mm. just being able to sweep up without the headache of uh, only sweeping in one direction. I know it only sounds like a trivial thing, but when you're working in there almost every day, it's such a nice thing just to be able to sweep up and not worry about that sort of stuff. So, yeah. And what about your feet and knees? Is that so much better on them? I don't know if I've noticed a difference so far, because obviously now it's a three millimetre thick rubber matting and then a seven millimetre thick PVC tile on top. The PVC is actually quite dense. It's um, quite hard but it does have some bounce to it. So at the end of the video um, about the flooring, I actually do some durability testing. Um, I pour some polyurethane glue and solvent stains and all sorts of other stuff. And I drop a hammer from ceiling height onto the tiles as well. And in the footage, the hammer just bounces. It doesn't do any damage whatsoever. So that mm. kind of demonstrates that it is. it would be easier on the feet. Um, maybe I just haven't had a long enough day in the workshop to notice yet because this project has been quite stoppy and starty because I've had various other things to do um, over the past couple of weeks. I've got a new, brand new PC. My laptop was really struggling because I got the latest version of the editing software I use and since then my laptop just hasn't been able to keep up. So I put a lot of time and effort into researching what the best combination of PC parts would be with the help of Gid Joiner, actually, because um, you wouldn't expect him to be a technical whiz kid, maybe, but he really knows his stuff when it comes to PC components and stuff like that. That amazes me. He seems like a pretty low-tech guy, as in I think he films everything on his phone, doesn't he? Mm. He's got loads of high-end effects packages for his editing software and all sorts of stuff, which, yeah, yeah he, he's really into that stuff. And um, he's been giving me loads of help and advice. So we've built this... Well, I say we. My brother has kindly built me this PC using all of the top components, and it absolutely flies. Editing now is just so much easier. I should have done it months ago. Oh, it makes life so much more enjoyable, though, isn't it, when you don't have to fight technology to get it done. Are you still using an iPad for editing? Yep. Uh, I've got an iPad Pro. Obviously, it was a big expense. Well, I expect your PC costs more, but I love it. I, I can sit on the sofa with my feet up and edit videos with a stylus, and it works so well. I went away for the weekend, the other weekend, and I would not have taken my laptop, but I slipped my iPad in, and I'd taken the camera because I was away doing some filming, and it meant I could edit the videos while I was away. Yeah, no, it's great. But yeah, probably no one else is interested in video editing software. That's so, true. Yeah. yeah, we shouldn't go too deep on this. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by ITS. They have a sale running at the moment from the 11th to the 28th of March with thousands of huge deals on power tools, hand tools, garden tools, workwear and more. Next day delivery, seven days a week when you order by 7pm on its.co.uk. Now, you might have seen I had a day out at ITS recently. Their head office is really impressive, and their stores are like an Aladdin's cave for tool fans. So, thank you, ITS. Another thing I've started thinking about is potentially building a fence for my table saw to replace the fence that's on it, because I just don't get on with it at all. I kind of wish I'd made more of a big deal about the fence issue when I made the table saw review video that I made a couple of years back when I first got it because over time I've realised that it just doesn't stay true um, to the blade. Every time you lock it, it tends to skew slightly away from the blade, presumably as some kind of safety device so that the workpiece doesn't snag in between the blade and the fence. But I just find really? it really frustrating. And, and I know it doesn't really affect the accuracy of your cuts as such, but... When I had my DW745, the DeWalt, and mm. also the Milwaukee contractor saw, I was able to set up the fence so that it was perfectly in line with the blade. And uh, I know some people prefer a little bit of runoff, but yep. I, I like it to be perfectly straight. Um, Agreed. And I just can't do that with this fence, and it's it's starting to really grate on me, so... I've started thinking about doing some kind of self-build fence, but the trouble is my skill set when it comes to things that move and more mechanical type things... The engineering is, stuff. Yeah, seriously lacking. 
think you've probably got a bit more skills in that area because I've seen you restoring old machines and all sorts of stuff. I don't know. I've watched many videos about building table saw fences because it's something I've been very interested in doing because you can buy a table saw for £100 and it will work fine. It's the fence that's terrible. I mean, a table saw is a pretty simple thing. It's a flat surface with a spinning blade. The Mm -hmm. fence is essential and the fences are terrible. Um, A lot of the videos, where I'm sure you've watched them as well, involve welding. And that's a skill I don't have. And I'm certainly not going to get into welding while I'm in a tent. I think that would go horribly (laughs) wrong. (laughs) I'd have a lot of holes in my walls. Um, So I had the Milwaukee table saw, which I thought the fence is just excellent on that. And I also had the Axminster upgraded... I think they call it a bandsaw fence. I think it's like, it was like 120 pounds. I got it for eBay for like 40 quid. It was excellent. Just undo two bolts and you could move the whole thing and it locked down. It was really good. And I had that on my Bosch table saw when I was back in Hampshire. And it was the best table saw setup I ever had. I had it built into a table and just, just a fence that works every time. You pull the handle, it stays square. It's just... Great. And lifts off easily as well, which I like to get it out of the yeah. way. But yeah, you see all these American, is it the Beesmeyer style fences? They, they just look great. A lot of the, especially old European table saws, they're really short fences that stop about halfway through the blade as a safety mm. feature. But I like a long fence that goes way past the blade. What was that word you just said? Beesmeyer? Yeah, I think Google Beesmeyer style How do I spell fence. that? I have no idea. I can't spell. <laughs> so, Beesmeyer, you would have never guessed this, is B I E S E M E Y E R. Right, I need to look at that because I've never heard of it. I, and this is probably because I haven't really done enough research on it yet. But the only fence video I've ever seen was the John Heiss plywood fence that he did. I think he did two, actually, two videos about it. I was contemplating even buying his plans. I've never I've never bought plans for anything ever before, but because I am mechanically or engineeringly challenged, um, I think having a set of plans there to see what John did in the situation would help me to design my fence, so I might invest in his plans. When you had your Axminster, was it an eight inch saw, your cabinet Axminster? Yes. Yeah, I got that. And then because it's all they did. And then like three months later, they brought out the 10 inch version. And if they'd said to me at the time, I would have probably waited and gone for the 10 inch. I'm with you. I, when I went from the DeWalt DW745 to the Milwaukee, I've really missed that, that extra cutting depth. And you get, you get a bigger motor to go with that because you need it. So what was the fence like on your Axminster? Did you have any issues with it skewing away? I just wondered if it was a similar setup to mine. No, it seemed to work fine. It was the biggest complaint I saw on the website. I always read the reviews. Yeah. And people moaned about the fence not being strong enough. And you always see people push at the end of the fence to see if there's any flex. But if you're putting that much pressure on the fence at the end, I think you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah, it's really not needed. So, no, it was fine. The handle was plastic which felt a bit cheap, but that's just nitpicking. The upgraded fence, as I say, I had before was definitely better. The Milwaukee DeWalt style ones are amazing, but this was a a good fence. I had the saw for about a year, or maybe a year and a half. Yeah, never had a problem, and I really liked how you could um, take the auxiliary fence off to do the thin rip cuts. Do you have one that does that? Yes, yeah. And I've started thinking as well that that's a feature that I want to incorporate into my build because I have that um, auxiliary fence fitted 95% of the time because it means I can cut really thin things and the crown guard over the blade yep. doesn't get in the way. So I kind of want that to be a permanent fixture. But also sometimes you kind of want a bit of extra height on your fence. So if, if I was making a, if I was doing a resawing cut, then... I would want to take that auxiliary fence off um, and possibly even make a taller fence. So I'm starting to think that a self-build fence that's designed to do exactly what I want it to do is, is going to be the only way that's, that I'm going to be happy. But like I say, it's not really my skill set. And also I think it's the sort of thing that I'll probably have to build 
two or three times until I'm actually happy with it. So I kind of want to build it out of rubbish material first because I know that the first one is going to be useless. <laughs> Sounds a good idea. And you can get all these aluminium extrusions these days with the T tracks in. So if you had that as the main bar or that as the face, then you can attach whatever you want onto it. Yeah. I wonder if you spoke to John... If you said, if I buy your plans, are you happy for me to like build your plans on video? Because that might be quite interesting. That sounds like a win-win situation. I kind of just want to use his plans as a reference. I want to take ideas from it, but make the fence my own. Because I've also got the added complication of that the other side of the fence needs to double up as a fence for my router table. Of course. So my requirements are quite bespoke, but I think I could probably get the general concept of what John did and tweak it to suit my needs. And obviously I'll call out John in the video. I, I got mentioned in a John Heiss video a few weeks ago. Oh, was it on one of his rants? It was, yeah. <laughs> what had you done? I had a proper fanboy moment. I was just watching his scrap bin channel on a Sunday as I usually do. And then I suddenly heard my name and it's like, I like sort of grabbed rear. John Heiss just mentioned me. <laughs> It was basically, uh, I think Steve Ramsey put out a video with Matthias Wandel about how project videos are dead. And I kind of posted a comment. I can't remember what I said exactly, but I was kind of implying that I make project videos because A, it's what I want to do. B, it's what my viewers tell me they want to see. And C, I don't really get the whole chasing numbers thing, making videos about 10 tips to do this and that when there's no heart behind that kind of video, in my opinion. Mm. And it's very rare that I post a comment on a video, but for some reason I felt compelled to do it. And John talked about the comment I made in his video, um, which, as I say, was a huge surprise. And uh, I commented on his video then just to say thanks for the unexpected call out or whatever. Spoke a bit more about the project videos being dead thing. And he came back with a really nice comment after that as well. It's just, yeah, it made my day. <laughs> Yeah, I don't mind people moving away from project videos because it just means more diversity in content. We've all got to find our niche. I've started this Badger Bites thing because I wanted to talk about these other subjects, but I don't want to stop doing build videos. So I've just put them up as extra little bonus things almost. But uh, yeah, there seems to be a real phase of these tips videos at the moment. But I mostly watch builds as in woodworking videos. That's what I want to watch. Uh, maybe we just lack ambition or something. I don't know. But I would rather, you know, the, the reason I wanted this to be my career is because I get to do exactly what I want to do mm. when I want to do it. You know, chasing numbers like that is just, I don't know, it just doesn't interest me. But Yeah. I was listening to the Making It podcast and they said they were talking about TikTok because they'd been to WorkbenchCon and did a whole talk about TikTok. And basically they were saying, when you want to learn how to grout your bathroom, TikTok's not searchable. Right. You can't search videos. I never even, I've never tried. So when you want to grout your bathroom, you do not go on TikTok and search how to grout your bathroom. And mm -hmm. I don't think you do on Facebook and I don't think you do on Instagram. You do on True. YouTube. Yeah. So there's always going to be tall reviews, how to build a shed type things. There people search for those and there's always going to be a demand for that. I think Steve Ramsey's point about project videos starting to be in decline is because obviously there are so many build videos already so if you make a coffee table, there's already a million views about a coffee table that might look similar. But I'm starting to feel that way about this additional content as well. You know, how many videos can you watch that, you know, 10 tips to do this or that or the other? Someone messaged me after our talk many episodes ago, and I totally forgot about it. So I apologize if you're listening. We was talking about carbite bandsaw blades. Oh, right. And how you can't get them in the UK. And they commented saying, mm, they're not that great, as in, you never get a good finish off a bandsaw blade anyway. You're always going to have to plane it. So you're spending a huge amount of money on something that is not that great. And what they recommended was on tough saws, you can get the B42 bimetal bandsaw blades. And I had a look, and they are much more expensive. And they say on there they last five to ten times longer than normal. But... If you're the kind of person that wants to put one blade on a bandsaw and never change it, it might well be worth the money. I think the trouble me and you have, I have ruined many a bandsaw blade with reclaimed materials by hitting that bit of unexpected metal. 
and I've done it on the mitre saw, and I've done it on the table saw, and there seems to be no damage to the blade whatsoever. But you hit anything like that on a bandsaw blade, and you've ruined the blade. Mm. I'll give it a try, because I, I would like something a bit more durable. That's the tool I really want, is a bandsaw. It's probably my favourite tool in the workshop, even though I'm known as a table saw guy and don't have one. But uh, hopefully I'll get a table saw soon. Definitely be a battery one because I can't leave anything in the workshop. There's no way I'm carrying out a cast iron table saw every time I want to use it. It needs to be something that I can pick up with one hand, take out there and then bring back again. It's a shame you're not a little bit closer because you could borrow my Milwaukee one because it gets used once in a blue moon at the moment. Yeah, and I, I would I'd definitely um, nick your framing nailer as well because I've got a uh, an outside project coming up. Well, you're all, always welcome to borrow stuff. I think I muddle through with what I've got. It's all right. A, a framing nailer is nice, but also a lot of the time I'm framing, I quite like using screws, actually. Yeah. And I totally see the point of a nailer if you've got to build 20 houses or something or put a fence up and you're you're on the clock. But yeah. when you've got all the time in the world, I can get through with what I've got. So I'm building a garden room. That's what I'm doing for family, hopefully next month but table saw i find is not really an essential tool in fact the first few shepherd's huts i built i don't think i used a table saw once mm. it's really just a mitre saw and a drill or a circular saw and a drill driver it's um very simple tools yeah really it's just cutting things to length rather than rip cuts isn't it yeah and and you can do a rip cut with a circular saw in fact i think i probably used a band saw which would be a very untraditional thing because cutting curves um, for the roof, uh, the cladding for the roof, I you know, could have used a jigsaw, but when you've got a bandsaw, it just seems so much easier to use one. I know, I know how fond you are of your bandsaws, so um, it must be difficult not having one. Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, it definitely affects my projects as well. And I suppose mm. that's quite an interesting thing, going back to minimal tools. It really affects the things you build. Yeah, but that that's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? Because I think sometimes having constraints can actually inspire you to come up with creative ways of getting around the issue. So even though it might feel like a hindrance sometimes, I bet in some ways it's actually inspiring you to be a bit more creative. Oh, I think definitely. I think uh, necessity is a good uh, driver of you know, how to do things. And I yeah. like finding ways around it. As I say, I had no interest in being a hand tool woodworker until I started working in my living room and the necessity of doing that uh, and I've quite enjoyed it it's I think the wood whisperer describes himself as a hybrid woodworker mm. and I think I'd probably go for that now I, if I need to resaw a bit of material I don't want to spend half an hour with a panel saw going through it there's there's a better ways to do it and same with a I'd quite like to get a thicknesser again I had a Metabo which is exactly the same as your Electra Beckham one there's no way I want to be wheeling that out to the workshop and bring it back in the house because they weigh a ton. Yeah. So I'd probably get a lunchbox planer. Well, that they're heavy enough, but I could carry that outside to use it and bring it back in and put it away again. What I probably need to do is fix up my shed so I can put things in that. I'm the same as you, really. I mean, it's very rare that I reach for a hand saw nowadays, and yet a hand plane I use in almost every project, and chisels I use in probably almost every project as well there's certain hand tools that i really feel do jobs that you can't do with power tools whereas sawing not so much <laughs> no i mean i was watching robin clevett with his hinge jig and even mm. using the router to cut the, the the mortise for the hinge he still gets a chisel out to square the corners up mm. okay you can get specialist um hinge chisels but it's still a hand tool I suppose the other way is you can get hinges with rounded corners now, can't you? So you can just use the router. But there's still definitely a place for all these things. If I haven't got the tool to do it, I don't like the solution to be, I'm going to buy the tool. Mm. I like to find other ways around it. Otherwise, I'd have uh, drum sanders and two different festival dominoes and a lamello and everything else. Yeah. Everyone commented last time, it looks like I'm sat in the bin. For people that are listening, not watching, I've got like this shield for my microphone and it's this um, semicircular thing and I'm right behind it. So it looks like my head is popping out of a, a, a bin or a cage. But I'm sat on my sofa because I 
I don't have a desk yet, but what I'd like to do is I've painted the backdrop behind my workbench a nice badger grey. So I want to get a stool and probably actually sit at my workbench and actually have the nice backdrop to sit this rather than the sofa. It's quite uncomfortable, actually. But um, yeah, don't worry, everyone. I'm not in the bin. <laughs> but I've never made a three-legged stool, so that's something I'm quite interested in doing. I don't know if I've ever made a stool, but it's a project I've got on my to-do list because I'd quite like to make some kitchen stools for our kitchen counter, but also I'd really like to have a workshop stool. I've never had a workshop stool, and um, I'm thinking one on casters might be really nice. And and I was thinking along the three-legged lines for that, potentially, but I haven't got around to drawing it up or anything. I had a workshop stool and I hardly ever sat on it, but what I found it really useful is just as a mobile pedestal because it's quite high, so if you've got pieces stacked up by the table saw, I'd put them on the stool, and it was just an extra mobile surface. But I've looked at a lot of three-legged stools, and people have these, I forgot what they're called, but they cut a mortise on a dowel, and you put them on the drill, and they shave away that, and it's like, oh, that looks a great top. They're expensive. Yeah. But I quite fancy making, like, a traditional three-legged stool. Cutting a mortise on a dowel, I'm just trying to figure out. It's like a pencil sharpener. So you put your dowel into this pencil oh, sharpener and I'm it just turns you. down the, yeah. the end of a dowel and then you can drill a hole in the other corresponding piece. I can't remember who it was. It might have been Matthias Wandel use like the chisel as the blade. Yes. To kind of twist it through and plane it off. It's very yeah. clever. Yeah, maybe I should do that. I saw someone the other day doing that with a plane iron as well. Yeah, so I could make my own. That'd be cool. But then I don't know how you spin the dowel. Yeah, because it wouldn't fit in the chuck of a drill, would it? No, it'd have to be a pretty thin dowel. But these actual mortise-making bits, they're, they're not adjustable ones I've seen. So if you want to cut a one-inch mortise, you need a, a different size for each one. So and they're like £80, £90 pounds each. Uh, it's tenon, sorry. Why am I saying mortise? That's probably why I'm confusing everyone. I see. The tenon yeah. cuttings. I might get one because I could make a few things. I'd quite like a bench and a stool. Or you could just build a foot-powered lathe. That's true. I could, couldn't I? I would like one. I quite fancy, this is fancy time, when I build the new workshop to have like an outside area at the back. So maybe the roof of the workshop continues two metres past the workshop. Like an overhang. Like an overhang and held up with a couple of posts. Or like a porch, I suppose, but it'd be on the back. And then have a little outdoor work area where I could have... I've always wanted to build a shave horse. Yeah. And a workbench out there. My living room workbench would go out there nicely under the little covered area. Be quite That'd nice. That'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah, I like working outside. Me too. It's just so much harder to film. It is harder to film, especially with the sunlight and yeah, trying to get everything exposed correctly, and then the sun goes in, and then the clouds come over, and yeah. Yeah, and the mic sounds terrible because it's windy. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's nice to actually do it, but it's terrible to film it. So we talked in the last episode about pricing your work and I've been reading some heated discussions on Facebook around quoting for work and to what extent you should break down your quote price. Some people are saying that you shouldn't break down in detail because it gives the customer an opportunity to kind of nitpick specific lines in the quote and say oh, you're paying too much for your timber or whatever. And others say that you should break down your quote because it gives the customer a bit more peace of mind. Um, my stance on it would usually be not to provide a breakdown, but to provide one if asked. And I say that because on occasion I've asked tradesmen to give me a breakdown of the price. And it's not because I want to nitpick. So thinking back to when I got a quote for our bathroom work, which went into installing the toilet, installing the bath, installing the sink, remove old radiator, replace with customer supplied towel rail, build small stud work wall to bring shower out level with old cupboards, install supplied glass blocks, tile and grout all exposed walls. So it just lists everything line by line and then at the bottom it gives a price. So what that invoice doesn't really allow me to do is to say, well hang on a minute, I could build a stud wall and I could do the tiling myself. So how much of that quote cost is in the tiling and how much of that quote cost is in the stud work? Is it worth my time to do it myself? Or if it's only a few hundred quid, would I just get the tradesman to do it? So that's a one example of where, you know, I would want the price to be broken down, not for nitpicking purposes, but just to better inform me of um, 
what I can and can't afford that tradesman to do. Now, as it happens, with our bathroom, we ended up just getting a plumber to do all of the plumbing bits and pieces and install things for us. And then I did the rest of the work myself um, because at the time we were finding it so difficult to find a tradesman to commit to doing the work or even show up to give us a quote. Yeah, it is a, it's so difficult to get people at the moment. So was labour a separate line in that? Thinking about it, as we were providing all of the materials ourselves and the quote was purely for doing the work, yeah, then I guess it was labor. all labour. Yeah. 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 I guess with more kind of tradey jobs, you kind of have an idea what the labour should be. And there's even websites that will tell you how much a job should cost within reason. If you're more of a woodworker, I watched a video the other day about this American chap. It was a business insider type video and they were interviewing him and he's selling river tables for $60,000. Wow. I mean, epoxy is expensive, but... (laughs) (laughs) It is expensive. (laughs) His labour was not £200 a day on that, was it? So if he was to actually put work out his labour, it might be $2,000 a day. You wouldn't want to put that in an invoice because someone would look at it and go, $2,000 a day in labour is ridiculous. But people were very happy to pay $60,000 for the table. Mm. So I don't know, sometimes it's best just to have a price and they don't need to know what the breakdown of that price is. That's, that's the price. If you want to buy the thing, that's what it's going to cost. I think maybe for more kind of creative, almost arty pieces like tables... Maybe for retiling a bathroom, you want to know. So it's it's complicated, isn't it? When I just moved house, so the solicitor had uh, quoted me a price and then they invoiced me and they broke some things down. So they added on printing costs, postage costs, all these things that came to hundreds of pounds. It just annoyed me because when I invoice a customer, I don't go, oh, and it was um, 16 pounds for the postage and the stamp and it's just incorporated into the price yeah and i think if they just put it all in the price i'd have gone oh yeah that sounds reasonable but just going 30 pounds for printing is like you know kind of taking the mick a bit that's just the cost of being busy there was no way of not having that so that is in your price i feel but generally on quoting personally i would just break down labor and materials and leave it at that. If the customer wants a breakdown of the materials, then I will give it to them because I would have done the work to price it up anyway and I don't have anything to hide. If they want to start nitpicking line by line and say, there's an issue here with the price for timber, then that for me would be enough of a turn off of that customer to to make me not want to do the job anyway. And um, I think sometimes weaning that out of the situation early at a quotation stage can be a good thing. Yeah. One thing I think people get confused on is VAT as well. I've seen people put VAT on when they're not VAT registered because they've downloaded an invoicing or quoting template and it has that section in. So they think, oh, I'll put it in. But if you're not VAT registered, you do not need to put the VAT bit in. I think I made that very mistake on one of my first ever invoices. And I showed it to my dad just to get his opinion and he was like why have you got that on there you're not that registered I felt like such an idiot <laughs> yeah well I, I, we probably all done it because you just download the template and you think well there's the box there I've got to fill it in my bathroom doesn't have an extractor fan in it which could cause a bit of damp I mean obviously I open the window but it's not the same as sucking the air out um, and it's not something I feel I can do myself. I don't have an SDS drill and to be able to cut, I don't know what, how big a hole they are, 100 mil? 100 mil, yeah. Is it a core cutting bit or something they call it? Yeah. yeah. I kind of feel the bit's probably expensive. The time I bought the bit and the drill, I might as well get someone to do it. And I just don't fancy doing it. Especially with the whole drill uh, kickback thing. What's yeah, that twist- called? Yeah, the wrist breaker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and there's the wiring in and all that malarkey. So, but the neighbour's having his bathroom done, so I'm going to talk to their plumber kind of while they're here. They might as well tack on to the end of his job, just putting a hole in my wall. Mm. Um, but yeah, to get someone to come out and do a small job like that, 
because you can't get a handyman to do it really because they're not going to have a core cutting bit and an SDS drill. They want to put a shelf up. Yeah, they'll probably price the core cutting bit into the job, I should imagine. Yeah, and maybe they haven't done it before. You want someone that knows what they're doing when they're drilling holes through your wall. But they have no interest in doing a... I don't know how much it cost. I'm thinking £200. Mm. Uh, Because well, the fan itself costs hardly anything, but everything costs 200 quid minimum, doesn't it? Just to get someone to look at it. Um, Yeah, it's so hard to get someone to come and do a small job. And so you do end up doing it yourself. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? You can save yourself some money. Mm. You didn't make a video. You did Patreon-only video, did you, of the bathroom? I did a series of Patreon-only videos focusing on each stage of it. And then at the end, I did a video showing the whole bathroom from start to finish on my main channel as well. But yeah, I I always like doing jobs like that because you learn so much. Initially, it's horrible because you you just feel like, oh my God, there's so much that I don't know. Where do I start? And then you start doing the research and you learn bits and pieces until you get to a point where it's like, I think I can probably do this myself. And then when you do it, it's like, wow, sense of achievement. And, you know, I, I like pushing myself out of my comfort zone to try and achieve new things because then you've got that knowledge for for future jobs if you don't forget it anyway i tend to forget things i i agree when i'm doing it for myself because there's no real jeopardy if i mess it all up i've wasted some time and some money but if i'm in someone else's house doing it then i'm ruining someone's life because they've got a ruined (laughs) bathroom But yeah, I stress about doing it for someone else. I've got to build this garden room for family and I was kind of stressing a bit about it and then I've just thought it all through and worked it all out and drawn plans and like, oh no, it's going to be fine and now I'm looking forward to doing it. Mm. And um, it doesn't really affect them because it's just in the garden but when you're doing something in someone's house, you did the kitchen worktops. I don't think I could do that. I'd be too nervous about um, something going wrong in someone's house. I've got to maybe do a pagoda uh, over a carport but it's a double carport so that's that's a big span yeah and so they're going to need to be big posts and i was thinking i don't think i'd even be able to lift the posts that need to be that if they need to be eight by eight posts say mm. maybe maybe they don't maybe they could be six by six posts but even that trying to lift them into a hole that's concrete is like i don't think i'm gonna be able to do that on my own i need help and then if i'm getting someone to help maybe i should just get professionals you've got to pick your battles haven't you yeah i would be surprised i mean how big a span is it because i would have imagined even a four by four post because i think that the risk of sagging and stuff with the rafters on top is probably more yeah, of a situation need to be six to be, by twos at least yeah, aren't they? i would have thought so it depends how big how big you're going i mean i used six by twos on my pergola and that's only an eight foot span which yeah, and I kind of thought a four by twos will be fine for that, but when I spoke to Gid, he kind of convinced me to go for the six by twos. So two that's what I ended car, up doing. Two, so two car cars, widths. I think you probably need eight by twos, but I think there's some span calculators online that might be worth checking out. I can't use joist hangers either because they just look horrible. It's got to be exposed. I don't mind the look of joist hangers. I quite like how they look, but. That's probably unusual because I've got a few comments on my pergola of um, the joist hangers ruin it. <laughs> I can see why you wouldn't like the look of them, if that makes sense. I don't think I'd personally mind because I don't mind like the industrial look. And anything that's got a purpose, I quite like seeing the purpose. I'm interested mm. in that. But this is for my mum and I don't think she'd, she'd want that. What have you been watching this week, Keith? Following our video about pricing, I saw that The Natural Workshop posted a video about pricing too. And he's just posted a second video about CNC pricing as well. But there are a good couple of videos and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave links to those in the show notes. The other video I'd like to mention is that latest Bish Bash Bosh video about the lamps. <laughs> I thought they were brilliant. I've not watched that yet. That's on my watch list. So maybe I'll watch those tonight. Yeah, I have to watch the Natural Workshop one because I saw him promoting that on Instagram and I was just having a flick through his profile and he's got his um, address of his unit and it's in March in Cambridge, which is like the nearest Ah. town to me. 
So he's just up the road. So I thought, oh, that's a good man to be able to tap up for local knowledge of what saw mills and where he gets his bits. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. He's got the same table saw as me as well, which is interesting. Have you asked about the fence? Uh, I haven't, actually. That's a good idea. Maybe I should ping him a message. How about you? I watched this a few weeks ago, and I put it in my uh, watch later list just to remind me, because I thought it was really interesting. And it's called Making a Unique Floating Shelves by Bending Wood. So it's curve bending, which I don't think I've actually tried curve bending, where you cut the slots almost all the way through the wood on the table saw, and you close them up, and they'll leave a gap because they close up at one end and open at the other. And he does it using a router cutter that's tapered. So when he closes the shelves up, the gaps close completely. And no it's way. very clever. And obviously he's done all the working out. So the way he actually does it is pretty simple, but it took some real thinking about and testing. But it's really nice because if you have the gaps, you've got to fill them with something and then it always looks like there's filler. I can see it being very you, actually. It's very mid-century modern, that kind of pill shape shelf. That's cool. It's a similar concept to what I've been thinking about for some bedside tables that I need to build in future, because I want that curved aesthetic. But the way that I was going to achieve the curve was uh, a bit hacky, if I'm honest. (laughs) So um, I'll check out that video. That that looks really cool. That's so clever, using a tapered router bit for that. Thank you for listening. You can find Keith on YouTube by searching for Rag N Bone Brown and me by searching for Badger Workshop. We have a Patreon page if you'd like to help support us in making future episodes of the podcast. Link to that in the show notes. And we have a Workshop Banter Instagram and Facebook page if you'd like to get in touch, which is at Workshop Banter, all one word. Mm-hmm.